Now it's time to talk shop. We'll explore what we learned in the last 16 months through the pandemic and approaches to inventory constraints. Get ready to move retail forward with our thought leaders. For this discussion, I'm joined by Bernie Minen of Big Lots, Steve Finkelstein of Vitamin Shop, and Amy Keenan of Party City alongside Andrew Blatherwick of Relex. And of course, we are talking retail. It's an area that's undergone a lot of transformation over the years, particularly over the last couple of decades with the popularization of the internet. And it's an industry that's always come out fighting, always weathered the storm. But my goodness, no one was prepared for the storm that was COVID, and retail had to adapt in so many different ways. The industry faced increased customer demand that led to a huge and unnatural boost in e-commerce. Coupled with inventory shortages, it faced unprecedented disruption in manufacturing and transportation in the supply chain, which included closure of all bricks and mortar shops. Retail has had to undergo multiple adaptions and evolutions in real time in order to stay afloat and satisfy demand. But now as the world begins to settle to embrace the new normal, there's a lot to think about, to reflect on, and to learn as we think about how best to move retail forward and into the future. So let's get started. Hi everyone, I just wanna welcome the panel. I hope you're all doing well. Hi. It's great to see you here. So the first question is for Andrew. What were the biggest constraints specifically around the pandemic for retail? What were the key ta challenges? I think the, the main, main areas were, as you've already outlined, that um, retail changed quite dramatically. We all, we all knew that uh, there was a big increase in online sales prior to the pandemic. Uh, but the pandemic just accelerated that beyond all recognition. Um, it took us into a new world where um, online sales were growing rapidly. Uh, as you said, stores were closed, but we also got to a situation where when stores started to reopen, um, then people weren't really wanting to go in them. So buy online, pick up in store, curbside. Um, the whole retail landscape started to change quite quickly. Now, if you add to that the fact that we also had supplier constraints, um, supplier movement or movement of product around the world started to change dramatically. There were constraints coming from abroad. So a lot of people started to change in terms of buying more local. Uh, a lot of retailers had to react very, very rapidly. And you mentioned earlier, retail is a tremendously dynamic marketplace. If there's one great thing about retail, it never stands still. And your, your phrase of new normal, I'd have to say, there is no new normal. Um, I don't think there ever has been in retail, to be honest. Normal is only what happened yesterday. Um, the, next, uh, the next phase is coming along and something different will be happening. But retail's done an amazing job in terms of trying to keep up with all of that. Because we had those massive spikes at the beginning um, when everybody panicked and started shopping and just grabbing everything they possibly could. Retailers had to cope with that. And then, of course, after that, you get a bit of a down, downturn and certain products are flying out, certain products aren't. Um, so it's been, been a really tough time for retailers and they've had to learn very quickly, uh, move very quickly. Um, and you've got three guys on this panel who are going to tell you about uh, how they, their business has evolved. Um, but it, it really has been a, a very different landscape. And I, I think going forward, we, we've got to think about how we now readdress uh, the change that that's brought in terms of profitability of retailers. Uh, and we'll come on to that a bit later. Yeah, absolutely. And on top of everything that you mentioned, there was also a lot of uh, challenges within logistics as well, you know, from air freight to ocean freight and port closures. And so I just want to ask you again, Andrew, really quickly, what do we all think that are retail's biggest learnings then? What can we take from all of those challenges that we've faced, um, particularly when it comes to supply chain? Now, I think one of the biggest things we've got to learn is how to respect and treat our staff. 
Um, because frankly, uh, we all took retail staff for granted for so many years. Um, retail staff have been transient. Uh, they tend to have been young people or people in older age or just moving through jobs. Um, and we haven't really valued them sufficiently. And I think we're, we're beginning to realize that people in the supply chain absolutely are core to every retail business. Um, and, you know, there are lots of guys in the supply chain who spent years and years and years just being shouted at because they're out of stock or overstock. They've never got it right. What's wrong with them? They must be dumb. Actually, it's a very, very tough environment. And suddenly people are waking up to the fact that if the supply chain starts to go wrong, your business is in trash. It, it's absolutely wrecked. And so people in the supply chain have suddenly started to, or other people in retail have realized that supply chain is core to the whole of their business. And they've got to look at it. They've got to give it more respect. They've got to think about the impact that other parts of the business are having on the supply chain. And therefore it starts to break down some of those barriers. You mentioned about logistics. Um, logistics has always been the end of the line. It's throw everything at it and let it just cope with it. Well, you can't always do that when you've got long lead times. You've got um, things like boats getting stuck in the uh, Suez Canal don't help. Um, you know, it's one thing dealing with a uh, pandemic. It's another thing when then a boat happens to get stuck as well. Um, so all of these things, logisticians have to try and work out. Supply chain guys have to try and make sure that they are protecting that business whilst at the same time um, doing their job, doing their day job, moving incredibly rapidly. Um, and that's a real challenge and they, they've done a phenomenal job. So I think the respect for people in the supply chain has, uh, has been something that, that actually is a benefit that's come out of this. I would agree with you. I mean, the amount of times I have heard the words supply chain and procurement and logistics uh, talked about, you know, across TV channels uh, from people that we've never heard those words from before. And I absolutely agree about workforce. They are the backbone to supply chain. And um, I'm glad to hear that you are talking about the respect and how we need to really retain that talent. So I touched on it in the introdu introduction, but the key word, not just for retail, but for all businesses and industries looking to make a strong post-COVID recovery is adaptability, which is what you mentioned as well, Andrew. It's something that typically, especially in supply chain, we've not necessarily been great at, but we're learning very quickly and we're embracing it. So Steve, I wanna ask you, what can we put in place to help us to adapt quickly? How do we incorporate that into our systems, into our partners, employees, and our ethos? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the number one thing to help us adapt and something that I loved everything Andrew just said there about, you know, supply chain getting a little more respect, a little more in the forefront, um, yeah. you know, just crunching the numbers, just focus on your lead time no longer is enough. And what I think really helped us move forward was partnerships and relationship building, both internally and externally. You no longer could rely on your vendors to hit their lead times every single time. So you had to build that relationship with them, understand where their constraints are, and really kind of work with them, kind of a help me help you relationship, because we're all in this, honestly, together. You can't, you know, the old ways of supply chain of banging on your desk and saying, I expect my orders to be on time and in full every single time, was kind of a thing in the past last year. So building those relationships and then internally, um, you know, the relationship we saw at the vitamin shop between our merchandising team and our inventory team really flourished last year, where it was no longer kind of that finger pointing, we didn't buy enough, we bought too much, but instead it was, let's believe in this product, let's buy into it, because we don't know if we'll get an opportunity to buy it again. And if we're wrong, we're wrong together, we're going to find a way to move through that inventory together and, you know, on to the next challenge. I love everything that you just said there. I mean, increased communication, we've seen that across the board and across supply chain and how important that really has been to success throughout the pandemic. You also talked about being in this together and we've spoken about collaboration numerous times over the last couple of days and then believing in the person, believing in the team. And I think that that's really important, not something that we've talked about within supply chain before. So thank you so much for sharing 
doing that. And now, Bernie, why is it so important then, you know, what's the impact of adapting quickly versus not adapting quickly? Well, Sarah, when, when you're hindered um, by taking too much time to make a decision, you're losing precious time. And I think we all learned over the last 18 months that time is absolutely critical and we have to be willing to step out and make a decision. And even honestly, if that decision is wrong, learning from it and moving forward, um, holding hands as a team is really critical. And um, just every second that you take to not take an action is a second that you're losing in securing product that's really critical for, for your consumer. If you think about a business that is essential, essential retailers, you're losing out on getting those Clorox clean wipes and all of those things. So um, it's just important to adapt, to not be afraid to take a chance and to jump out and do it. Just go for it. Just do it, right? Not be afraid. Um, mm -hmm. I like what you said about time is critical. I mean, we we knew that time was critical before, but now with everything that's happened throughout the pandemic and all of the lead times totally thrown out the door, you know, I think mm -hmm. we've really, really understood how critical that that component is as well. So Amy, I want to bring you into the discussion as well. What were the successes? What were the failures? And how are they informing your strategy now moving forward? I know with a lot of the discussions that I'm having, we're talking about manufacturing potentially moving and manufacturing for local markets versus global markets. So how is all of this playing out for you? Um, so a, a few points, you know, everything everyone has said has been great so far, um, you know, and I want to echo the, the challenges that we've had in logistics have just been unprecedented this year. Um, we have manufacturers that have shut down because of COVID. We have manufacturers that have gone out of business. Um, a large percentage of our business comes from uh, Southeast Asia. And we had so many things that came, um, came into uh, performance after COVID after the reopening of our stores that we never would have expected sales in. Um, for example, window markers with all of the drive-by uh, celebrations that everyone was performing, uh, drive-by birthdays and things of that nature, or uh, bob wigs and cowboy hats were big because of TikTok. And, and to see those giant lifts in sales and uh, to have no capability to react to those um, in, mm. in, in a timely manner is so difficult, but um, I think the biggest win for us was the collaboration amongst all of our teams, uh, being able to go out, find new sources for these products, um, trying to find domestic sources for products if we knew that we weren't going to be able to get inventory from our international suppliers that we would normally get our product from to hold us over until we can get more product from those international suppliers. Um, you know, a, a big win for us was uh, we fully integrated um, into relics for our entire supply chain this year, meaning retail, wholesale, and manufacturing all within the same system. And that gives us the ability to have forecasts at the item level for our wholesale demand so much faster than we ever had in the past. And having those on hand immediately to be able to go out to a new source and say, here's how much we need, here's when we need it, and here's what that demand is going to look like um, has been a real game changer for us. And it's probably been amazing to see right? Seeing your team collaborate and find new products quickly. I think that's one of the pieces that Bernie was talking about with time, you know, being able to source either raw materials or new products quickly is a huge, huge thing. And we're still seeing challenges, you know, in Southeast Asia and Asia. I mean, just today or yesterday, we heard about Vietnam and not accepting imports. So as we mentioned, successful adaptability relies on having the right infrastructure in place. The right collaborative partner is absolutely key to that, having the right team. Bernie, Steve, Amy, one of the key points that has arisen out of all of your businesses' partnerships with Relex has been flexibility. So the flexibility of that solution allowed you to meet demand, manage stock, to really flex your own offerings as much as possible. So Amy, I'm going to start with you. I'd love for you to share those experiences. Can you share some of that and how that flexibility has made a difference for you and your team? Absolutely. So 
our stores closed completely during the pandemic last year. There was a period of time where we were open, we were not open for business at all. Uh, so what does that mean for your forecast? Um, you know, that means you now have a period of time where there's no sales history. And so we were really beneficial, benefited by our, uh, our partner, Cassandra, uh, to be able to work on figuring out best practices for correcting those sales during that time period, the, the flexibility that the system had to be able to do that. Uh, to, to make those corrections for that time period so we didn't impact our sales in 2021, we weren't hurting our forecast for, for the future, uh, was great. And I can say that um, we were quite successful with that now having fully anniversary that closure. Uh, we, we weren't in any uh, detrimental situation with our forecast. And that's all the work and the collaboration between the Relics team and, and our team to make sure that all of that was put into place. And then also the, the flexibility that when we found that opportunity where we needed our wholesale and our um, manufacturing business built into the system, so quickly Relix was able to turn around and start those projects. We had um, our fully integrated supply chain completely rolled out within eight months. It took us four months to get wholesale um, set up through Relex and another four months after that to have our um, manufacturing business rolled out in the system. And that's just wow. because of the amazing work of the Relic team. Wow, that's amazing. I thank you so much for sharing that. Bernie, do you have some experiences that you can share with us as well? My goodness, yes, we do. Um, Big Lots, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were deemed an essential retailer. And so um, I'm sure that y'all are very familiar with Big Lots. We shop there every single week. And you uh, know that we carry a wide range of products ranging from food and consumables all the way to furniture. And um, we encountered some really interesting um, situations at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone was super focused on stocking up on those essentials. And for whatever reason, we all know the bath tissue that went insane, um, canned foods, dried pasta, things like that. Um, and we saw huge surges and spikes related to um, those particular items. Then as we moved through the pandemic and the panic and the fear started to wear down and um, the government started to issue stimulus checks to help um, people get through being unemployed or not being able to work, whatever the case may be, um, people were, and people working from home were tired of working from home and looking at their same stuff every single day. So then our business really shifted and moved into selling more of non-essential products. And so being able to put events in the system to be able to normalize that demand, um, to Amy's point, to correct those sales and get them back to something that is um, not being influenced by those crazy spikes was really key to our success coming out of the, um, the pandemic as it was winding down just recently. Um, in addition to that, a lot of our suppliers that make furniture, this is a, probably a little known fact, but a lot of the um, raw materials that go into making furniture are also used to make PPE. And so we ran into shortages for things like foam, making mattresses and um, upholstery cushions, like cushions in your sofa. And so um, we were able to work with the Relax team to be able to develop something for our, um, for those deliveries. Most of those are direct to store deliveries. We don't bring that product through our distribution centers because it's so large. And we were able to um, constrain the system to what the vendor had available for us. So we were able to proactively write orders that um, aligned with what they had available to, um, to provide to us. I would say the third example that I have is um, really just, um, being able to shift on a dime and, um, sorry, I just completely lost my train of thought, uh, to be able to shift on a dime and react into the changes in the demand as they were happening. It was, the Relax team was super um, helpful in that. Um, sorry, the example that I wanted to give was we had some local um, mun municipalities that um, we're not allowing stores to sell non-essential product. And so the store could still be open. They could sell their food and their consumables, but they couldn't sell furniture, throw pillows or anything like that. And so we were able to work with, the, um, with our Relax partners to implement something so that those items just wouldn't even replenish to the stores when that um, particular 
lockdown was happening for the sales of those products and then um, correct the demand associated with not selling the same thing that Amy had where you had no sales we were able to correct that and carry forward amazing well it sounds like you know pivoting quickly is you know something that Relax has really been able to help you both throughout the pandemic and that is huge because that's some a topic that I talk to a lot of people about is a, is around being able to pivot quickly, especially with all of the the disruptions that came our way in supply chain over the last eighteen months. So, Steve, I'm going to go over to you because Vitamin Shop actually rolled out the system during the pandemic, and this wasn't something you had in place beforehand. So, what was that rollout like? Tell us a little bit about your experience. Uh, well, the rollout, you know, the implementation team was fantastic. I think, you know, one of the things, we didn't see this coming. You know, we, we designed the system around our normal baseline business where, you know, traditionally we're sitting at 95, 96% in stock. The team, you know, we only have eight planners over here. So the team, you know, we really built it around managing that 5% exceptions. When that 5% turned into 10, turned into 15 or even 20, you know, we started to realize that we needed to relook at how we handle stock out corrections. And I think that was probably the biggest finding that we found post go live. All of a sudden, when a large percentage of your assortment is out of stock with no back in stock date, eventually the system starts running out of forecast background or forecast history. And our forecasts we did see at times were going down to zero. Um, once we caught that, I want to say it was two weeks of working with the Relex team before we had a plan on exactly how we were going to attack that. We implemented and tested that and we moved it forward, um, which now seeing how the system's operating now versus this time last year, it, it's been phenomenal. Um, additionally, just the way that the user can change business rules not on a fly, because obviously you want to test everything before you put things out there, but relatively quickly, you don't have to come up with the perfect answer right away. You have to come up with the, you know, something that's not going to put the company at risk, something that's going to cause improvement, but you don't have to wait for that perfect solution. You could dial it up and dial it back over time without having to really rely on your IT department just about at all. So there was really, you know, anytime we wanted to dial up these uh, forecast freeze rules that we created, or even we put in a lot of rules, and I'm sure, you know, the Relex algorithm diehards out there won't like hearing this, a lot of rules going around the safety stock in the system, because we wanted one thing and one thing most importantly, we want to protect our most important items in our most important stores above and beyond what the Relex algorithm necessarily gave us. So we were able to build a long set of really an if-then tree um, around how do we make sure that we are just never out of stock on vitamin D, C, zinc, our top protein products, and really kind of put an additional focus saying, I know it's an investment above what we probably should, but you don't know when the next level of supply is going to come in. So I'd rather own it and react to having too much than trying to chase based on lead times down in the future. Absolutely. It sounds like you had a great journey, um, even though it was during the pandemic. So we've talked about flexibility, but the other key to success in a time of instability like this is really visibility. It's a word that I've heard over and over again. It's a word that a lot of people that I talk to use a lot as well. And when you put that with flexibility and collaboration, that's a combination that's pretty hard to beat. And I know that you all have found that increased visibility across different areas to be invaluable in the Relax solution. So maybe if each of you can just talk us through what that has meant for your business. So Bernie, I'll start with you. Sure. So um, we deal with a lot of imports um, at Big Lots and being able to on the fly change the lead time for a vendor and understand what is that going to mean for my projections, for my orders, to be able to share that information with our vendors so that they can secure the raw materials and the capacity in the factories to actually make the product has been really critical for us, um, truly a game changer. So I would say that that's probably our main win is being able to um, have clear, clear visibility to what's happening in the future and what will happen if we change something to react to our current situation. 
Absolutely. And it feels like we're seeing changes on a day to day basis. So I can only imagine how mm -hmm. valuable that is to you and your team. Uh, Steve, let's go to you next. I'm sorry, but you cut off a part of your question. So I was hoping I was going to get enough from everyone else to answer it. Can you repeat it? <laughs> no problem. So we're, we're going from flexibility into visibility. So we want to know from you how visibility by working with Relax has, you know, really changed your business. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the number one way, the, you know, the visibility to the forecast over a time horizon that you know, respects minimum order quantities or for us when we do our contract manufacturing and our coordinated groups or our bulk MOQs, um, being able to look at a long window of where do we expect our inventory to go? And honestly, we've been using, uh, implemented about four months ago, we've been using all of the Relax data to drive open to buy, which I know, you know, sounds crazy to most retailers. We're just kind of getting our feet wet with open to buy and it's given us great visibility throughout the entire organization using all of the data coming out of Relex as to where are we going, where are we overspent, where are we underspent, and where do we see the forecast going from here? Absolutely. Have you seen um, a difference in your workforce and going from working in the office to working remotely? Has this helped you at all? Yes, absolutely. You know, it, as you know, we, we went live in the middle of the pandemic and actually almost 70% of my team is new since the pandemic. So, you know, one interesting thing about working from home, especially in a job that is so reliant on systems, I've actually found it to be extremely beneficial when it comes down to training, best practice sharing. If you're no longer sitting in a conference room, kind of squinting at a screen or looking so over someone's shoulders, but you're actually able to collaborate in real time. And, you know, you can take notes on one screen while paying attention to the presentation on the other. Um, so I've honestly, the, I would love to get back to the office. I would love to see my team in person here and there, but I see work from home kind of being something that's going to stay around because I think there's a lot of benefits to it. It's not just the work-life balance. There's actually productivity benefits to working from home as well. Absolutely. And I think, you know, a lot of people are looking at it differently, right? Are we going in full time? Is it a hybrid effect? So I wanted to ask you that question. So Amy, over to you. How is visibility and working with Relex changing the way you and your team are working as well? Sure. Um, so like I said before, I think our biggest win this year was the, the full integration into Relix for our supply chain and having that visibility for the wholesale demand to be able to talk to our vendors. It completely changed those vendor conversations. The team's able to pull long range forecasts. They're able to give visibility to what's going on. What are we going to need? When are we going to need it? Um, it's changed the way we're having those conversations. Like Bernie said, we can uh, show them this is going to be the impact of increasing the lead time. This is what's going to happen. Here's how long we're going to be out of stock now between, you know, when, when we're going to receive this one PO that we have open and, and when our next orders are going to come in if we change our lead time. So we can see so quickly and have at our fingertips an understanding of all of the implications of what's going on in the world today, right? Um, you know, our our transit times going from uh, 35 days to 42 days to 56 days from Southeast Asia and, and what that does to our orders, what that does to the size orders we need, what that's going to do to our safety stock at the DC. Um, we have all of that visibility now that we previously didn't have the capability of seeing in the wholesale part of our business. So that's really, I think, been the biggest win for us. It's, it's having this, um, the full uh, supply chain in Relics has given us all of this visibility that we just never had as a company before. And, and I think it's really, uh, it's really been a great unlock for us. Absolutely. And those lead times have definitely increased so, so much. I mean, from raw materials to even shipping, you know, logistics, not being able to get on a boat and missing, you know, three or four different sailings. Everybody on your team and you also, all of the three of you as well, have probably seen so many changes. I've been in supply chain for over 20 years and, and it's just been a crazy 18 months. So let's talk about, you know, new methods of delivery. How does retail look to prepare for the future overall? Inevitably, there'll be a continued evolution and COVID has played a part in accelerating it in some areas. So Andrew, I want to bring you back into the conversation. What do you think each 
each key area that retailers really have to focus on now for future success? I love this question because I think, you know, we always need to look at the future. And we've talked about innovation over the last couple of days as well and how important that is. So what are the key areas that retailers really need to focus on so they can ensure that, that future success? Yeah, I think um, we touched on it earlier. The One of the issues that's changed is that as retailers have moved down more and more of a multi-channel, omni-channel type uh, approach, actually it's hit the bottom line. It's hit profitability. Um, and so what we've got to start looking at is how we rebalance that, how we actually start to get some of that profitability back. Let me go back one step further, though, because a lot of people recently, I've heard some crazy uh, situation where people say, oh, you can't forecast anymore. You've got to throw away the forecast. It's useless. Um, people will just have to have a stab in the dark. Well, that's that's rubbish. That doesn't happen. You've already heard from uh, Amy and from Bernie and Steve. That's not the case. What you need to do is to utilize that forecast very well. Um, but more importantly, what you've got to do is start to break down the forecast by channel. Look at it in more detail. Look at it in a more granular level. So what is coming from the retail forecast? What's coming from the online forecast? What's coming from the um, BOPIS? I think you guys call it. We call it um, um, uh, different things. But um, buy online, pick up in store. What, what, what's going through the curbside? So it's looking at all of those different channels and then look at those forecasts, break them down and then build them back up so that we can pop properly understand both the availability that we require to each of the channels, but also how that then impacts on our staffing levels, how it impacts on our shelf space and things like that. And so coming back to the whole argument that, that says we've got to start looking at how we can become more profitable. Amy talked earlier about how breaking down those silos between the store stock and the warehouse stock and, and actually having that full control right the way through the supply chain, that's a great way of moving. It's a great way of being able to really look at how you're going to flow stock efficiently through the supply chain and therefore make the whole business more profitable. The next step is then to look at saying, okay, let's now move into a more unified retail environment where not only are we managing the inventory flowing through the supply chain, but we're managing the space in our stores so that we can then flow that inventory through the supply chain in the full knowledge of what space we've got and how it's selling in stores so that we're replenishing at a real time basis, going in just when we need it. So it's going straight on the shop floor and we're not double handling, again, adding profitability. You then start saying, well, now that we know all of that and that starts coming together, let's bring in the staffing element so that we've got the right people to start to bring in the inventory, put it on the shelf and make that efficient. Now we start to regain some of that profitability that we've lost because we're sending out more and more stock directly to customers or um, to pick up in store where we're double handling. So let's take a lot of those functions that have always been part of retail and just make them more and more efficient by breaking down the silos and tying them together and understanding how they interrelate. And then we can start to feed some of that profitability back into it. Um, and that becomes absolutely crucial. Um, Steve was talking about maximizing availability um, on certain items. Now, maximizing availability is, is no dirty word. That's absolutely what we should be doing. That's why the solution is so adaptable so that you can do those things under, under certain circumstances, you need to be able to react that way. Bernie was talking about how imports and, and the, the changes that have happened with stock coming in from abroad and having to look at local supply. Again, the adaptability, the speed at which you can move, you can actually become, you can manage that. You're in control of it. You're not losing control. You're in control of the supply chain and how it's operating. And that's really where people are having to move more and more. So moving down, breaking down the silos, moving more towards a unified retail where you are controlling all the elements of retail rather than battling with people in other departments is going to become more and more critical over, uh, over the coming years. 
Absolutely. And I want to bring in Bernie and Steve to this part of the conversation as well. What do you think about what Andrew has just said and what the key areas you feel retailers should be focusing on for future success? So Bernie, I'm going to start with you. Um, Sarah, I would say that we, we need to continue to focus on um, being agile and being quick in making decisions. Um, time is always of the essence. Uh, of course, the closer you are to making a decision, the better decision you're going to make. And I think that um, just really focusing on empowering people to make decisions is going to be really important as we move forward. Absolutely. I love that word, empowering. Steve, what about you? Yeah, I think, and I think Andrew actually touched on a lot of these points, you know, the customer is who we need to serve here. And it's however the customer wants to shop, where they want to shop, when they want to shop. And as retailers, we need to deliver to the customer first and then figure out over time, how do we make that more and more profitable? Um, you know, vitamin shop over the year, you know, like most companies did, you know, we implemented Bopis, curbside pickup. We, you know, in almost 30 days after the pandemic, we partnered with Instacart to get same day delivery. Um, we're doing buy online, ship from store. And even there's been a lot of small tweaks inside of the store on how a bulk disorder comes down to them. You know, something as simple as rather than it being, you know, at three o'clock each day, you check your bulk disorders. We know the customer might order it while they're sitting in the parking lot and just want you to bring it to the door. So more of a push system to say instantaneously, the order's here, you need to go pack it. Um, you know, so it, ultimately it's all about what the customer wants. And as retailers, we're going to have to first figure out what the customer wants and then to figure out how to keep our margins healthy while doing so. So many options and so many transitions. It, it makes my head spin and all of your teams have done such an amazing job at that. Amy, what are your thoughts on the key areas for retailers to focus on for future success? Um, I think a really important thing right now in, in the world that we're stuck in is to look at when you can't get everything you want, how do you get the things you need, right? What, what are those top priority items? Um, I guess I would love to have every single item that every customer comes in looking for at all times at their fingertips, and I want 15 of all of them, um, but that might not be achievable right now uh, at this point in, in the world that we're in with manufacturing and logistics the way that they are, um, especially when we have manufacturers that aren't even up to full capacity yet. We still have plant closures that are um, we're experiencing with some of our manufacturers because of COVID cases happening in these, in these plants. So if, if we're still facing those challenges, how do we help them decide what's the priority? If you're not fully up to capacity because you can't be fully up to capacity because of localized restrictions, how do we make, um, make the efforts with those conversations with the vendor or supplier to say, how, how much do we need of the most important things? And let's put our money there and make sure that we're getting those things that we know are going to be our key drivers of our business. Um, because again, we're not going to be able to get every single item that we need. So I think right now that's a really big focus is to make sure that we have those most important things um, and then uh, helping our, our vendors get back up to capacity, get their heads above water so that they can start producing all of those other products that we need as well. Um, and it, it's really important, I think, that partnership with, with your vendors. Great suggestions. And I love leaving people with uh, tangible things that they can take away from a conversation and, and implement and think about and talk to their teams about. So how can the industry as a whole uh, take hold of some of the insights that we've talked about today and utilize them effectively in adapting for the coming years? Bernie, I'm going to start with you and then we'll go around to everybody on the panel. Sarah, I'm sorry, like Steve, I had, you were breaking up a little bit and I'm not sure what the whole question was. No problem. I will ask you again. So how can the industry as a whole take hold of some of the insights that we've talked about today and utilize them effectively in adapting for the coming years? Like, is there anything that they can really implement right now and do for their business, do for their supply chains, help their teams move forward and adapt? So this answer might sound a little bit weird, but I think that one of the biggest things that um, we've learned coming through this is really how critical it is to develop 
strong relationships, not just within your organization, but with your partners. And when I say partners, I don't mean just vendor partners. Um, I mean, in particular, our partners at Relex, because the most powerful tool really that we have is the software that's helping drive our decisions. And so making sure that we have good relationships where the people that we're partnering, partnering with really understand our objectives is crucial. Communication and, and um, defining clear objectives is really key. Absolutely. Communication, communication, communication. Amy? Um, I think really looking over current processes and procedures and, and seeing where are those pitfalls, right? Like where, where do those communication breakdowns happen, like Bernie was talking about? Um, where, where are we falling short and not being able to succeed? Um, you know, really analyzing and looking at the business to understand, because if we don't look at where um, our issues are, we never know what it is that we can improve. Um, and I think that's been a huge success for us is, is we've looked at um, our entire business and said, where are the areas where, where, where we're, you know, getting, getting caught and, and how do we fix that? How do we, how do we turn around and change those processes? How do we do things differently? How do we bring in new teams, create new teams to do these things where we have gaps, where we have process gaps, where we have opportunities um, and, and investing money back in those areas um, to in turn be able to get more money out of the company, right? You know, building a, um, a strategic sourcing team was a really big uh, goal for us this year um, because of all the issues going on in sourcing, right? And, and that's been uh, hugely helpful to, to our inventory planning team this year. So just one, I think a great point. That is a great point. We haven't talked a lot about sourcing, but of course, you know, when we're talking about manufacturing and having to source raw materials or source new products, that's so, so true. And even gathering data so that we can be more predictive or no, more proactive than reactive like we have been in the past. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's two things. And I wouldn't even say last year changed it, but it kind of put more of a focus on it. Um, you know, one th advice I would say, control the controllable. If we try to fix every problem that was out there right now, we, you know, we'd be running around and getting nothing accomplished. You got to really go after the areas where you actually can make a difference. And when you can make a difference, you know, execute with, you know, excellence. Um, you know, it, right now it's just exceptions have become the norm. And if you try to chase down, you know, they're no longer exceptions. They're just part of your day job. So really find a way to focus your team, focus what you want to do. And if you're going to do it, believe in it and, you know, Go deep. Absolutely, I love that. And at last, but absolutely not least, is Andrew. What do you What do you think? Well, other than just implementing Relax in every business and every retailer around the world, I guess um, the other things <laughs> the, the guys have already talked about so much of, um, of of what are the right things to be doing. The work working with partners, working and listening. But that's internally as well as externally. Something that people within Relex know, I just beat this drum the whole time. Breaking down silos within a business is so important because you end up with departments fighting each other, which creates inefficiencies within a business. Um, and that just is totally counterproductive to actually running that business correctly. So break down those silos within the business and then start to work with your external partners. Uh, make sure that you're, as, uh, you're communicating with them as much as possible and you're passing things back and forth. But can I introduce uh, another, another element that we, we haven't talked about yet? And I think he's so important because um, just as we were coming online, I heard your previous speaker talking about food waste and you asked a question about food waste. The whole environment is something that is absolutely the elephant in the room at the moment. We're all desperately trying to turn our businesses back to being profitable, trying to make them um, sustainable and really get things moving. But we've also got to make them more environmentally friendly. We've got to reduce food waste. We've got to reduce inefficiency. We've got to stop, sh stop shipping fresh air around the world. We've got to stop moving things that we don't need to move. Um, and actually, the supply chain is again critical in that area. 
running the supply chain efficient, efficiently and effectively is actually the best way to help the environment because we just make things work better. Um, and we have to start to focus on that. It's becoming a bigger and bigger issue. We know we've got the climate change summit coming up in the next few weeks. Um, and governments around the world are going to have to start focusing on that. And that means as businesses, we are going to be under more and more pressure to focus on that as well. And the supply chain, again, is absolutely central to the whole of that move to making our businesses more um, environmentally um, sympathetic and, and actually just doing things better. Andrew, you are speaking my language. I love that. I think sustainability is a huge focus for organizations. And I think that that's a perfect end point to this discussion um, because we've talked about so many things from flexibility to visibility and, and ending on a note around sustainability is amazing. So thank you so much to Bernie, Steve, Amy, and Andrew for joining me today. Retail is an industry still very much feeling the impact of COVID. It's looking for ways to work smarter, to embrace the insights it's gained from the, the past few years, and it's looking to make sure that in doing all of that, it's mitigating future risk as well, so it can move forward with confidence and strength. And it's events like this that really help to educate, to arm businesses with the tools and the inspiration they need so they can go out there and thrive long into the future. You know, it's remarkable to see the way retailers are adapting through disruption to support their local and global communities. You are all moving retail forward, and it's incredible. Thank you all for joining me on this panel discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.